Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. My email address is mccormick at csus.edu. And this is the third introduction to Bayes' theorem lecture for my inductive logic Phil 61 course. Uh, it goes along with um, Ian Hacking's uh, uh, Introduction to Probability and Inductive Logic, uh, Chapter 7. Uh, but it stands alone. We've been um, slowly going back and forth between discussing what Bayes is conceptually in English and starting to do problems and starting to see how Bayes theorem gives us an answer to the question, how do I fold multiple probabilities together? How do I incorporate evidence um, into uh, uh, my belief system and update my beliefs according to new evidence? And it depends well on how connected that evidence is to the hypothesis under question and how common that evidence is more generally. So in this lecture, I'm going to uh, peel another layer off the onion here, explain Bayes a bit more technically, do more examples, and move us back and forth between actual applications of the math and the Bayes problem, and then trying to understand the parts of the theorem and the parts of the equation and how it works. Okay, so <clears throat> we have been focusing our attention primarily on this version of Bayes' theorem for two mutually exclusive hypotheses. So in this version, I've substituted H for hypothesis and E for evidence. And we are considering a case where either the hypothe hypothesis is true or it's false. So we have a relatively simple denominator. We just look at the evidence in the cases where it's true and where it's not. Um, and we've also seen a couple times now, but I'm going to review, that these parts of the theorem have names. So the answer, or the left-hand side of the equation, or the thing that we're trying to determine, is called the posterior probability. And it's po called posterior because it means what is your credence, or what is your belief or confidence in the hypothesis after, or posterior to, having made an observation. So once we've folded the observation in, do we believe, or to what extent do we believe, the hypothesis? So the posterior is the answer that we get from Bayes' theorem problems, usually in the cases we're doing. The likelihood. Okay, so it's important to emphasize this. Um, in ordinary non-technical speech, people will use the words probability and likelihood interchangeably. And you may even hear me doing this in some of my earlier lectures. But now we've got a specific formal technical idea or concept for the notion of a likelihood. A likelihood is just that thing. It's just that top left-hand side of the numerator. And it's a very, it means something very specific. The likelihood is the probability that this evidence would occur when the hypothesis is true. Or it's the accuracy of the test. It's the strength of the connection between that hypothesis and the evidence. If that hypothesis were true, would it produce that evidence? Is that the sort of way it would manifest in the world? That's the question we're asking. And that we're assigning numerical values to that in this equation. And they belong right there on the left, the top of the numerator. Um, also, very importantly, the right-hand side of the numerator is called the prior probability or the base rate. It's the probability that the hypothesis was true, considered without or prior to making the observation or gathering the evidence. Okay, so you know, you're know you on a jury and you've heard a whole bunch of evidence um, from and arguments from the prosecution and from the defense that the uh, defendant, let's call him Smith, is guilty. So let's suppose that up to this point in the trial, Folding in or considering all the evidence you've heard so far, you think that the probability that Smith is guilty is 0.7 at that point. So that would be your prior. And then we might hear a new piece of information, a new piece of evidence. Maybe some eyewitness testifies that Smith did it. And we need to know the eyewitness's reliability or the accuracy of the reliability or the accuracy of the eyewitness. And we'd plug that value in and we'd fold in this new piece of information to get a new posterior probability of Smith's guilt that's now been updated in the light of this new evidence that we've observed. And you will see some examples like that in a second. Okay, uh, down here on the bottom, the right hand side of the denominator. 
Uh, I, sometimes I've been calling this the false positive rate, and that's the question. This number we're after here is the probability that you would find that evidence given that the hypothesis is false. Uh, you know, let's think about all the other reasons or all the other circumstances um, that where the evidence might have happened like it did without the hypothesis being true. Um, and or how common is the evidence without the hypothesis being true? Because if the evidence is really, really common, um, even when the hypothesis is not true, then observing that evidence is not that remarkable. Uh, and we'll see some examples for that in a second. Um, on the bottom right of the denominator is the probability that the hypothesis is false. That equals to 1 minus the probability that it's true from above. Um, and that one's uh, for two mutually exclusive hypotheses. You know, say in our hypothetical case where we were considering Smith's prior probability guilt was 0.7. So this would be 0.3 because those two have to add up to 1. And we're considering the exhaustive set of cases where Smith is either guilty or not guilty, 0.7 or 0.3. That covers all of the possible cases. OK, so here's another way, yet another way to think about it. Um, and I'm lifting this passage from Stephen Pinker's new book, Rationality. Uh, here's another way to understand it in English. Um, our credence in a hypothesis after looking at the evidence should be our prior credence in the hypothesis multiplied by how likely the evidence would be if the hypothesis is true, scaled by how common that evidence is across the board. And if you look at the way he's described that and you look at those components of Bayes' theorem that I've got in that diagram, that should make some sense. What we're doing is we're folding in and scaling our belief in the light of the new information. And it depends on how uh, connected the observation is to the hypothesis and so on. Um, here's yet another way to put it. And this is also from Steven Pinker, who's got a very nice, uh, clear um, way of describing it. Um, once you've seen the evidence, should you believe the idea? So suppose the prosecuting attorney has now shown a new piece of evidence and you're wondering whether or not you should now believe more in Smith's guilt. Well, that depends. You should believe it more if the idea was already plausible or probable with a high prior. So that's that top right hand side of the equation. You should believe it more if the evidence is especially likely to occur when the idea is true, when there's a high likelihood. So in general, um, if the two numbers on top of this equation are big, um, if the prior's high and the likelihood's high, then that's going to make that equation top heavy, and it's going to push it up towards 1. Whereas the other way around, you should believe the hypothesis less if the evidence is commonplace, and as a result, we have a high denominator in the equation. OK, so that's yet another way to think of it conceptually. Let's look at some real cases, and those actually help us understand it. So let's imagine, um, and I'll call this Bayes' pregnancy problem number one. Linda just tested positive for being pregnant, but her husband has a vasectomy, so there's only a 1 in 5,000 chance that she is. Highly improbable, very low prior. The accuracy of the test she got it from CBS is 99%. What is the probability that she is actually pregnant given that she tested positive? Okay, so this is a straightforward, um, simple solution Bayes theorem case. We've got the prior, which is 1 in 5,000. We've got the likelihood, which is 99%. And we can extrapolate the other numbers we need to plug in for the equation from that. So here I've repeated the original problem. But let's look at the equation. So I've taken the Bayes theorem. And for H and E, I've now substituted in P for pregnant and plus for positive test result. So the question is, what's the probability she's pregnant given that she got a positive test result? And it works out to be um, all of that plugged into Bayes theorem. The likelihood times the prior over the likelihood times the prior. Um, times the false po false negative or false positive rate um, times the um, chance that the probability is not the, that the uh, hypothesis is not true. Okay, so we need four things to plug in the values for this equation: the accuracy of this test, that is the likelihood. What's the probability you'll get a positive given that you're pregnant? Okay, so take pregnant women. If I give them all a 99% accurate 
uh, pregnancy test, if I'm just testing women that I know are pregnant on other grounds, then that test, if it's 99% accurate, will say that 99 out of 100 of those women are in fact pregnant. That's how good this test is. Her prior probability of being pregnant is 1 over 5,000, which works out to be 0 0.0002. So she has very low prior probability. Um, it's, a, it's a weird thing that's happened. And notice that we've got a very low prior and a um, unlikely result that goes the other direction. We're trying to fold those two together. Okay, so the false positive rate for the test, um, not knowing anything more about the accuracy of the test, all we've been offered is that it's 99% accurate. So we'll just say that the false positive rate for the test is 0 0.01. And what that means is, um, what's the probability that you get a positive given that you're not pregnant? So now you're telling that you're, now it's given a false positive. Um, so if the test is 99% accurate, then it's 1% false positive rate. Um, and the probability that she's not pregnant, given that the probability that she is pregnant is 1 over 5,000, the probability that she's not pregnant then has to be 0.9998. So that's the four numbers we need to be able to plug them into the equation and now solve for the posterior. So once I put those numbers into this equation, I get 0 0.019. All right, so what question did I answer? I asked the question, what's the probability she's pregnant given she's tested positive? And the answer I got back is around about 2%. So it's really, really low. Uh, that seems weird, right? That seems weird that she got a, preg a positive test result, but the result of Bayes is that she's only 2% probable to be pregnant. That is, she's very likely not, not, she's very probably not pregnant. She's probably, this is a false positive. Um, why? What happened? Why did we get such a low result here? Well, it seems like she tested positive. We ought to give some more credence to that, right? When you ask doctors, when you ask other people, you ask people who don't know a bit about Bayes, you ask people who haven't trained their intuitions carefully enough with the Bayes theorem, they're going to say, well, a positive test suggests you're pregnant, right? It seems like Linda's, Linda's got to be. Well, the answer here is that her base rate was so low. When the base rate is so low, like in this case, in fact, it's orders of magnitude lower than the accuracy of the test. So what do I mean by that? Well, the test is only two decimal places accurate, 0.99. But her probability of being pregnant is 0 0.0002. So it's two orders of magnitude less likely that she's pregnant. So we've got a real outmatch, or, or the, the, the base rate is really outstrips the accuracy of the test. It means that test is probably giving us a bad result in this case. Bayes helps us synthesize the two probabilities, the prior and the observation, for a new improved conclusion based on the evidence. And here, the very low prior means it's probably a false positive um, in cases like this. Now, if she, her prior had been higher, um, we could have trusted it and we would have gotten a better, a higher result. But her prior says it's going to take more evidence than this to swing us over to believing that she's pregnant, given that our, our prior is so low from the outset. We already gave it such a low credence. Okay, so here's another problem, <clears throat> another fairly straightforward, just solve for the posterior probability. Jake is convinced he doesn't have COVID. The disease he thinks is not real. The liberal media has been exaggerating it, and he doesn't know anybody who's died from it, so Jake is suspicious. He puts his probability of having it at 0.05, really low. But at work, they forced him to take a test because he refused to get the vaccine. He was really annoyed about that. The test is 0.999 accurate, and it tested positive. What's the probability that Jake has it? Uh, so actually, this one's not unlike the Linda problem in the last case, except it's got some different numbers and different dynamics. So there's the problem. And here, again, is um, Bayes' theorem with substituted, substituted in now. Instead of pregnancy, we're talking about COVID. So what's the probability you got COVID given he tested positive? And it's going to be um, plugging in values for those four things. We need the accuracy of the test, which is 0.999 in this case. That's actually pretty unusual. Um, the prior probability of having COVID is 0.05, given that Jake, uh, before he took the test, thought it was really low. Um, the false positive rate for the test, since we don't know any more about it than just the accuracy, we'll call it 0.001. We're getting that from the accuracy of the test above. And the probability that he doesn't have it is 0.95, given that the probability he does have it is 0.05. 
So now we plug those numbers into this equation, into those spots, those four numbers, and we crunch the numbers, and now we get 0.98. Okay, so what's happened? What's the question we've answered? The question we asked was, What's the probability he's got COVID given he tested positive? This looks very, very likely, very probable that he has COVID. 98% probable he's got it. What happened in this case? Why is that? Well, um, why in the Linda case did we get such a low number? And why in this case did we get such a high number? Well, again, it has to do with the differences between the prior and the accuracy of the test. This test is really accurate. Um, 0.999 is to, to one, it means only one in 1,000 cases are um, false positives. So this test is really accurate, and it's enough to swing us from being 5% likely to have, have COVID to 98% likely to have COVID. When you run those numbers and you punch that all through, figure out the calculation. Okay, so you have to retrain your intuitions about these things. And the biggest difference here is that the, the accuracy of the test really contributes a lot to this case. Okay, here's another instance. And this one's slightly variation on theme. So Jane now is convinced that she's got COVID. It's always been just a matter of time. She was sure she was going to get it. She's always doomed to suffer. She figures the probability is at least um, 0.8. Then the doctor sends her to the lab to be tested because she keeps pestering him. Their tests come back negative with a 90% accuracy rating. What should Jane think now? Okay, so now we've got a case where her prior is relatively high and the accuracy of the test is pretty high, but the test says a different result than what her prior said. Okay, so there's the problem. And again, here's the, and, and, and here's the equation. Now, the difference now, and, and notice that she got a negative test result. So pay attention to this on homework problems, on practice problems. In the previous case, we considered that Jake only we, we considered that Jake had 5% probable to have it, and then he got a positive test result, so it was pushed up. But here's a case where she um, had a 0.8 of having it, and then a negative result is going to push it down. So you have to pay attention to that. What we're asking now is, what's the probability she's got COVID given she tested negative? It's the probability of getting a negative given that you've got COVID. Okay, so that's going to be a false negative. Times the probability you got COVID over... Uh, and here's going to be the true negative cases. So we flipped all these around. So here's our four numbers. The probability that you get a negative, given that you've got COVID, is not 90%. It's 0.1 because this, notice, is a false negative. This is a case where you get a negative test result, but you have COVID. That's what we're asking for in the numerator to get this answer. And then down here, what's the probability for in the denominator? What's the probability you get a negative given that you're not, that you don't have COVID is 0.9. So then what happens as a result is that this denominator is big. Notice before I had said if the if the likelihood is high, if the prior is high, then you're, we're going to re revise our answer towards the high end. And if the denominator is high, then the answer is going to go down. Well, this has got a big denominator because of that 0.9 right there. Okay, so this answer becomes 0.3. So what has happened here? Uh, we set out to answer the question, what's the probability she's got COVID given she tested negative? And what happened is that she was at 80% before, so there's very good reasons for thinking she had COVID before, but then this test revised that down by, you know, um, uh, 0.5. It lowered it from 0.8 to 0.3. So now we're in the neighborhood of thinking she probably doesn't have it. Now what I would do here is take another test and figure it out and it would push it up or push it down. But... Um, uh, Jane probably doesn't have it, and it's and the, the important thing to notice here is that um, the prior said one thing and the test said another, so it pushed it the other direction. So you have to pay attention to which way is the evidence going? Is the evidence going in favor of the prior, or is it going contrary to the prior? And that will make a difference in how you set these problems up and get them correctly um, accounted for in Bayes' theorem. Okay, so another I'll give you another English example to try to get our heads around this. Suppose my neighbor is up all night making a lot of noise, and I suspect he's on methamphetamines. What's the probability he's on meth, I ask, 
given that he's up all night. So let's call it probability of M given U. And in English, um, we can consider these different components that go into the equation. So the probability of H, the hypothesis, the probability he's on meth, this is the prior probability of the hypothesis that your neighbor uses methamphetamines prior to your observing him being up all night. So did you have any re reasons or was there any grounds to think he was on meth before this? This might be established different ways. Maybe we use the base rate of meth use in the population in your town. Maybe you've got some other evidence. Maybe something else has led you to think that. That's how you assign a number to that. The likelihood, then, in this case, is not the accuracy of the COVID test or the accuracy of the pregnancy test. It's the strength of the connection between using meth and being up all night. When people are on meth, how often are they up all night? Does meth keep them up all night? How strong is the connection between the observation and the hypothesis? If, it, if the hypothesis is true, does it produce that evidence? Because if meth doesn't keep people up all night, then there's my only piece of evidence, and I don't have any grounds for thinking this conclusion is true at all. But if meth is very strongly connected to or correlated with keeping people up all night, then that strengthens my evidence because that numerator goes up. And then on the bottom, the probability uh, of the that we'd find that evidence given that the hypothesis is false. Okay, so what are those? Well, that's the, the probability of being up all night for non-methamphetamine reasons. Are there other reasons? Or um, is that evidence otherwise common? Maybe there's some other things that produces that same evidence, namely the observation of his being up all night. These are the false positive cases where they're up all night, but he's not because he's on meth disconfirming cases. So maybe he works all night. Maybe he's doing cocaine. Maybe he's an energetic insomniac. Or he might just have a lot of stuff to do. Um, and the question is, how common is that evidence in other circumstances? And it turns out in this case, it's pretty common. Um, and so thinking of cases where that evidence would be true, but the hypothesis is false, turns out to be kind of a challenge. I'm going to talk about this in a minute in connection with confirmation bias. Um, we are highly prone to confirmation bias. For the probability of E given H, it's hard for us to think about scenarios where E is true, but the hypothesis is false. So we often underweight or discount the probability of E given not H in our intuitive calculations. But Bayes' theorem makes us fix that. It explicitly addresses this human bias. Okay, so then put in English or quasi-English quasi-formula form, Here's our question. What's the probability he's on meth given he's up all night? Well, it equals the probability that you'd be up all night given you're on meth. Does meth do that to people? Times the probability he's on meth, the prior. And then that all goes down to the, numer the denominator as well. And then the other part of the denominator is, well, what's the probability he'd be up all night given that he's not on meth? times the probability he's not on that. These are the countervailing or the other kinds of circumstances that would work the other direction. So once you get assigned values to all of those, then you could update your prior or update your information and draw a conclusion. And I don't have a, um, uh, I'm not gonna plug values into this. It's just for us to understand how the conceptually, how the different components fit together in the, in the uh, formula. So again, on the left-hand side is the posterior probability. Um, on the uh, right-hand side, the top part of the numerator is called the likelihood or the accuracy of the test or the, um, well, the likelihood is the other way it's understood. Um, the right-hand side of the numerator is the base rate or the prior. Uh, the denominator is the total unconditional probability of the observation. It's all the ways that people are up all night on both sides for two exclusive hypotheses. And here's where we explicitly think about disconfirming cases where you'd find that evidence, but the hypothesis is false. And we're starting to see this now more and more with different kinds of cases, COVID and pregnancy. And you see this, the same structure of the problem, even though they're radically different sorts of cases with, uh, you know, a, a, a defendant in a criminal trial who's been accused of being guilty or who's alleged to be guilty of the crime, um, you know, ranging across a whole different set of different kinds of problems. Okay, so um, that little component of the denominator, the probability of E given not H, that forces us to consider where the evidence might be the same, but the hypothesis is false. We have to think about false positives when we incorporate, when we use Bayes' theorem to, to update our beliefs. So <clears throat> I'll give you some examples just to think about this. This is a guy I ran into in a coffee shop one day. He was insisting to his buddy 
that when he wears his lucky shirt, his jersey, his team was more likely to win basketball games. He was raving about how uh, when he wears that shirt, it makes the team win. And I don't know how this is supposed to work. I don't know if it, if the other team, if the people who are fans of the other team, if they wear their jerseys, does the juju like cancel out or how does that work? But what we need to do to really figure something out like this, whether it's true, of course, it's not true. But what happens in these cases where th this guy's come to believe this is true is that he probably neglects the instances where he wasn't wearing it and the team won. Um, or he might remember a few poignant cases where um, he wasn't wearing it and the team lost. Um, but he's probably not doing the numbers or keeping track of all of that. And we also neglect the instance, instances where we're wearing it and the team didn't win. We make up some other excuse or some other story. Those are the confounding or the disconfirming uh, evidential cases that would have gotten figured into the denominator. Um, here's another one. People think that airborne cure, prevents colds. And a lot of people say, well, I took it and I felt better. Um, but what you don't think about is the cases where you didn't take it and you didn't get a cold because your immune system might have just solved it or cured you or might have um, prevented you from getting a cold anyway. Um, and there's also the instances where you did take it and you got a cold. Like we, we tend not to remember those. Think of your friend who goes to Vegas and claims to have a technique or a trick for winning at slot machines or winning at blackjack or whatever. Your friend's going to come back and tell you about the times he won. He's not going to tell you about the cases he lost and not going to tell you about the money he lost. That's much harder to remember, especially when that slot machine is, is when it dumps money, it the alarms go off and the bells and the whistles and the lights and all that, and that makes a memorable case in our minds, whereas the losses all just, your money just disappears, and that's not memorable, that's not easily available, so we're not getting a representative sample. Um, and these are all failures of representativeness of our information, that your information when you're watching the news is heavily tilted towards um, stuff that's lurid or exciting or dramatic or negative, um, and you won't see the good things that happen on the news. There's no reporting about um, peace on the news. There's no report, reporting about the crime rate going down. There's just reporting about the negative uh, events, and those are, and we have a very strong negative bias in that kind of case. Uh, here's another case. Uh, people believe that acupuncture helps their back pain, but often what they neglect to look at is instances where you didn't get the back pain, um, or you didn't get the, sorry, you didn't get the acupuncture and the back pain subsided anyway. That happens, and you may not even keep track of those kinds of cases. Or there, you recall there are instances where you had acupuncture and your back pain didn't improve, and what does the acupuncturist say you should do? Oh, you need to do more acupuncture, and that, of course, is going to cost you some more money. It's that you didn't do enough, and then you keep doing it until it gets better, and you then you give credit to the acupuncture. Same thing happens with your astrology forecast um, and lots of other places where people are just taking your money. Um, okay, so uh, confirmation bias then, we've got a way of talking about it more technically, more specifically than we did in the beginning of the course. So confirmation bias, you'll remember, is the mistake of noting evidence that supports a favored hypothesis while ignoring or neglecting evidence that would disprove it. Um, and like, for example, the stockbroker who says, I'm really good at picking winning stocks. Last year I bought GameStop and then it blew up and I made a bunch of money off of it. And this is just like your gambler friend who says, I've got a method uh, for winning in Vegas. I won $200 and they neglect or don't remember or don't notice the other cases where they lost money. They don't keep track. Um, to evaluate one of these claims and to counter for confirmation bias, we need instances where this guy picked a stock and it didn't win. Um, we need instances where he didn't pick a stock and it won. And it turns out, actually, there's a really nice section of Kahneman's book where he talks about a researcher from Berkeley, Terry Odeen, I believe is his name, who actually went and looked at, all, at thousands and thousands of stockbrokers' picks so that when a stockbroker sells some stock, it's because they think it's going to go down. And when they buy a stock, it's because they think it's going to go up. So Odin tracked all these stocks that brokers had bought and sold and then looked to see what happened to them. And actually, on average, what happens is that people buy stocks and they go down and they sell stocks and they go up. Just the opposite um, uh, of what is intended to make money. And stockbrokers actually 
um, tend to do worse than even dart-throwing monkeys, I think was Odin's claim, or maybe that's Philip Tetlock. Um, they tend to do worse than, than dart-throwing monkeys, but what they do is they remember or recall or cite or notice the events where they picked a winning stock and they neglect and forget about or don't mention to you um, when you're wanting to do stock trades uh, about the cases where they lost money. Um, sports, politics, elections, disease, all these sorts of cases where you think, um, I knew there was something suspicious about that guy, or maybe your gaydar, your relationships, and so on. All these places where we think that we're good predictors or good judges, or we have good astute sense. In many cases where we think we're good at predicting X, confirmation bias distorts the evidence we cite. And Kahneman's got a lot more to say about that in uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay, so... Let's summarize what we've done in part three. Uh, we have looked again at some more problems for Bayes' theorem for two mutually exclusive hypotheses. We've solved some of these, and we've thought about the parts. So there's the posterior probability, the prior probability, the likelihood. And now we've considered more specifically about how false positives figure into Bayes' theorem. Um, we have seen, uh, at least in the previous lecture, we talked more about what happens when you ignore base rates or, or, or we neglect base rates. And when those base rates are really out of whack with the, um, the accuracy of the test, sometimes we get these weird results like the Linda case where um, she's probably not pregnant, but she gets a positive test result. and We don't know what to make of that. It's because her base rate was so low. Um, and we've considered how confirmation bias uh, when we do our intuitive calculations, tends to distort our answers to these questions, but Bayes helps us compensate or control or fix for that. All right. Um, and finally, we're, we're calling the bottom, the whole denominator, the unconditional probability of the observation, where we're trying to think about all the cases where you might find that evidence, whether the hypothesis is true or not, and those figure into making the denominator big, which makes the posterior small. Okay, so that's the end of part three. We're going to do some more complicated problems in part four, but we're now getting into a much more sophisticated understanding of how Bayes' theorem works.